Well, welcome to the July 2021 United on the Fly virtual education meeting. Um, tonight's meeting is going to be all about salmon fishing and tips, and we have three amazing co-hosts that we're going to introduce to you all right now. Sure. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Hill. I use she, her pronouns, and I am currently based in Haines, Alaska, which is home to the Clinkett people on the Chilkat River. So I was asked to talk about coho salmon. So we will be going in um, a little deep on coho salmon and um, how we fish for them up here in Haines, Alaska. <laughs> um, I'm Katie, I'm from British Columbia. Um, I'm on an island just west of uh, British Columbia called Vancouver Island. And um, tonight I will be teaching you about um, how to fish for salmon on a spay rod, um, harvesting tips and um, gear setup. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel. I'm from Caledon, Ontario. And today I'm gonna be talking about king salmon and how we fish for them here, what we use and what our setup is. Hi everybody, my name again is Chris Hill and I am um, based in Haines, Alaska, which is home to the Clinket people here on the Chilkat River. And um, the Chilkat River in uh, and Klingit is storage container for salmon. So we have a lot of salmon come through our river. Um, we have, we are home to all five species of Pacific salmon. So we have uh, chum, um, we have sockeye, kings, coho or silvers and pinks as well. Um, our most prolific run is the coho run. And this starts, uh, a little bit in, they start to come in in September. We have a very late run. So they start to come in in September and they go all the way through December. Sometimes we can actually even catch them in January. But for the most part, the winter fishing here is just practice on the river for 30 minutes. Um, so that's a little bit about where I am. So my house is right on the other side of the Chilkat River. And um, the coho season is one of my favorite seasons. Let's go to the next slide and see what's on there. And I added this. So I, for tomorrow's Tuesday tip, Chris, you are going to be the author for that. So this will be the um, blog. It's already up. Um, so that'll be the blog for tomorrow for you for your Tuesday tip. Yeah, so everybody definitely check that out and share. Great. So this is sort of the back of the, um, of a silver or a coho salmon and just for identification purposes, you can see the spots on the upper lobe here. Um, and then that really thick tail part, um, which is pretty important. And then also the silver color is really how you can determine as well as the spots on the top of the fish there. Um, and then 13 to 16 anal rays as well. Next. So the other really important thing on, on these silvers is you can tell by their sort of the coloration of their mouth and their teeth. So obviously the, the white teeth, but then the edge of their gums are darker color, sort of a blackish color. Um, and depending on where they are as they're coming up, you'll start to see that um, sort of metamorphosis uh, happening in their face as well. Um, and so a lot of times where we are fishing, they are coming, we're catching them right after the ocean. So they're coming in um, still having sea lice and uh, a bunch of still sea uh, urchins on them as well. So it's pretty neat. So very, they're very silver. As they get further up into the river, they start to change a little bit and change their colors as well as their face. So one of the best parts and one of the reasons why I love fishing for, uh, for coho is because of how they react and and just the the fish itself is a very strong fish and you will typically once you hook a fish once you hook one of these cohos they will jump in the air and do a lot of acrobats and be very very <laughs> uh the, you'll know they're on your line that's for sure. Um, and it's really fun. And it is, it, it all depends on the season. Last year, we had a really bad season. Um, typically, we will go, you know, we'll catch a good number of them every day. And last year, I caught one. So it was very, very slow. Um, 
and last year my now husband caught zero and that's like not like him and we fished really hard the whole the whole season so um but typically you should be able to catch a few a day uh and then you know some seasons are are uh, pretty slow like last year this one was from a couple of years ago um and um this is right outside of our of our house right down right down the street come there come here okay Okay, next slide. So their habitat. So they are, you know, as as all salmon do, they come in from the ocean after a couple of years being out and come back to their the spawning grounds of where they were born. This is um, a photo of the Chilkoot River, which is on the other side of town. And you'll see the river in the forefront here. And then there's a huge lake. And a lot of them do go into the lake to spawn. And then there's a all the way in the back of that picture, the river continues and a lot of them do go up into that river. A lot of the fish that spawn in the lake are mostly sockeye and pinks. And then you'll get some that go up into that river there. And this was taken, we, we were fishing this day and it was in, um, this was in sort of December-ish, early December. And this is probably around two in the two or three in the afternoon, it's already getting dark. So a lot of times what we try to do is um, how do you fish, really, how do you fish? Where are the fish sitting? Most of the time they're moving, um, especially right when they come in from the ocean, they're trying to get upstream as fast as they can on the high tide. And so you can target these silvers and cohos in um, fast moving currents, um, really deep holes. We always try to look, the river is always moving every year. So when you go out there, it's hard to tell. Last year, the fish might've been in this one spot all season, this one deep hole all season. And the next year you go out there and there's zero deep holes right there. So a lot of it is exploring the river every single year. We don't have spots where, you know, we don't have holes that are there every year. So um, a lot of it is walking up and down the river, wading up and down the river, finding these deeper holes or these benches um, that get deeper as you go. And we'll fish the seams of those benches um, and try to get into some of those deeper holes. And um, we try to fish on the high tide. Uh, the incoming high tide is the best time um, because they're coming in, they're getting pushed in from that water. And then if it's the lower tide, then we'll try to find some of the deeper pockets to see if they're sitting there for a little bit um, hanging out. So the equipment that uh, I use up here is a single hand rod. Um, we also have folks who do a lot of spade casting up here as well. But for the most part uh, in the fall, I use an eight weight single hand rod a sink tip, I always need to have a sink tip here um, because you're trying to really get deep into those holes. So um, I'll have a sink tip on and you can use a type three to T14 sink tip with a floating line. Sometimes if it's really high water, I'll put a full sinking tip line, on, a full sinking line on there. And then um, about 12 to 15 pound mono as well. And Oh yeah, that's my little. <laughs> okay, so one thing about this picture is the bear spray. Um, here we always have to carry bear spray uh, because while we're fishing for fish, so are the bear at the same time. And during this time, um, particularly when the coho come in is also when the chum salmon come in and we have a large run of chum salmon in the fall. And there's an area upstream um, about 10 to 15 miles called the bald eagle preserve and it's a preserved area for the bald eagles because every year um, in the fall about four to five thousand bald eagles come from all around the country um, to wait for the chum salmon to spawn and die and then eat and so um, because we have such a late season run all these eagles come around they wait for the salmon to die, to spawn and die. And then that also brings out a lot of the bears as well. Okay, so rigging and tackle. So like I said, um, we typically use sink tip to a loop-to-loop -loop knot. 
Um, and then you have your leader, mono, uh, up to, to, your, to your fly. What we also do is we tend to, we don't have a fly shop in town. So a lot of times we'll, we will um, make our own flies and make our own leaders. And so I made one here for you guys to see. So this is basically 30 pound test here, right? So you got your, you'll have your line, here's your loop, your, your sink tip, and then you have your 30 pound test all the way to a swivel here. And then we put about 15 pound test on there. And once we get that, then we'll have some sort of fly to tie on the end there. And so the flies that I typically use for coho season, um, I really started, I, I stink and love this fly. This is the double bunny. I don't know if you guys can see that well. Let me try to get that light away. Um, so this is the double bunny. It's really cute. It's adorable. Um, white and pink are great. And it has a weight, the eyes, the eyes are weighted. So I have been using this a lot and this got me my only, my only fish last year. We also use uh, Dalai Lamas with a trailing hook. I like using these trailing hooks a lot. Um, you can see that there. So we'll use Dalai Lamas again, pink and white is a good color. And then um, you really never can go wrong with the Clouser minnows. And we'll do either chartreuse in white or olive in white or black or pink and white. Um, some other flies that you can also use are leeches. Um, egg sucking leeches are really good as well. The articulated leech black is best. We don't use too much purple, but that's a good idea. Um, then the Dalai Lamas. Flesh flies are really good. You'll see a lot of, I mean, all of the salmon are decaying and dying. And so, and then there's a lot of eagles that pick at them and the bears and so forth. So the flesh flies are really good if you start seeing a lot of dead salmon all around. And then poppers and pollywogs, which I've never used that before. All right. Okay, fishing techniques. So, um, like I said, a lot of times you're going to try to find them either in the swift moving currents or in these deep holes. And so the silver salmon are really attracted to fast moving things in the water that are like kind of really in their way, like, and it irritates the hell out of them. So there are these like jerky movements, these erratic like things that are kind of like just in the water column. They really like that and they want to move it out of the way. Um, and so you're basically casting a little bit upstream, letting it float down, right? And then you're going to strip in a little bit. Um, and you want to keep your rod tip sort of in the water pointing as your line goes down that river, goes down the river. And then you'll see the swing there and then you're going to strip in a little bit. And sometimes um, I'll get a lot of fish coming in on the strip at the end there. And so, you know, sometimes you think, okay, well, I'm done with that cast. I'll just strip in, but really keep going, paying attention because that strip might be just the part where, you know, just that jerk or that movement in the water makes them really want to grab it or try to move it out the way. Um, what else do we have here? So the other thing about stripping um, and retrieval techniques, sometimes I'll do small strips, sometimes I'll do long strips, sometimes I might do slower strips, and it really just depends. And I try to do it all and see what is, if I'm getting some bites, but maybe not any, like a couple of bites, not that much movement, I might keep trying that strip a little bit, like that same sort of length and, um, pace. And I might try that a little bit more. If that's not working, then I'm going to go to a fast strip if it's a slower water. Um, or I might go to a slower strip. It all depends. But trying and sort of trying out different ways while you're on the water is probably the best. And there's no real like you have to do it this way. It's going to work every single time. There's nothing like that. Um, I think that's it for the fishing techniques. Okay, and then Heather, you're going to do this one because you have had some great success on wogging and we do not really wog here. 
So I'm going to yeah. turn it over to you for this. Okay, awesome. Um, wogging. Oh, man, I actually did a 12 days of Wogmas a couple of years ago because it's trying to be super goofy and like, you know, do you wog the line or friends don't let other friends wog alone. I mean, being totally cheesy and silly. Um, and wogging is pretty fun. It's just, you know, basically like a pink mouse, um, a pink popper or some really at times there's certain fisheries um, that you're trying to decide or try to choose which fly actually won't work when you're trying to wog. So um, anybody that hasn't tried top water for either coho and or pink salmon, um, definitely give it a try. But um, this is just kind of a, a traditional bass popper. So if you have some poppers, I've, I've uh, wogged with green poppers, all kinds of, it's just top water. Um, and I'm just going to show what the WOG leader example is, and I'll just kind of quickly talk about it, and then um, Katie will be up next. But as far as the WOG leader, it's pretty simple. This is, you're going to be using a floating line. Just do that loop-to-loop -loop connection, and really you're using a pretty short piece of mono, anywhere from three to five feet, kind of your typical streamer length setup, um, and then 12 to 15 pound uh, test. And basically what you do is you try to, this is a point you know, where you really want to try to cast as far as you can, um, because I always like to say the more real estate you have, the better. So if you can cast far, get it out there, let it sit, and you can actually retrieve it in a couple of ways. You can pop it so you can bring it back. Now, if you've ever popped for bass, sometimes it's like some, some people say pop and pause, right? So pop and then pause, pop and then pause. Now, I have found personally for coho and or silver salmon wogging is that it helps to have a con continual V. So what I mean by that is when I'll usually put my fly rod underneath my arm and then I just pull like this and I'm creating that, that uh, I'm creating basically the fly to V or come towards me. And it's actually pretty fun because you can see the salmon come behind and start to wake, especially if it's in shallow water, if the tide's just coming in and that the river's fairly shallow. And you watch them, you watch them. And that's the hardest part is like, you can't, don't set the hook until they eat. And you get all excited and all anxious and you're gonna miss fish. We all miss fish, we all lose fish. This is a part of it. Um, but basically you're just trying to create a V, have it come. And you can double hand or I'll do a single hand pop um, and then bring it towards me. Um, you'll see that V, the fish, like you literally see the mouths come up, eat it, and then you set the hook. Um, and then just like Chris said, those acrobatics, it's like there's, they jump and they're fun. And, you know, you just pray that you actually are going to get it in to hand. Um, and yeah, you know, wogging is really fun. It's again, pink salmon will eat top water flies as well. Um, so if it's a pink year, and pinks are every other year in certain areas. So um, for us right now in like Pacific Northwest, it's a pink year, but in Alaska, I believe last year was a pink year. Is that correct? Yeah. So they switch every other year, but um, just something to kind of add to your toolbox and your arsenal of, of ways to, to fish. And again, you want to cast as far out as you can. You want to strip that fly in and then wait for the fish to eat the fly. That's like the hardest thing to do because it's so exciting. Um, but it's, it's really fun. So Chris, when I come up and visit you, let's, I want to try to wog. I, yes, <laughs> yes. Now I'm excited. I was like, Heather, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't do that here. <laughs> so now I want to wog with you oh and God. I encourage everybody, whoever is coming up, if you guys ever see yourself in Southeast Alaska, definitely reach out to me, come up to Haynes for the coho season. It's bananas. It's super fun. Also, I see some of my Maryland friends on here, Maria and Kathy. So I'm just waiting for you guys to come up. <laughs> awesome. Anything else that you want to add, Chris, about silvers? Is there any tricks to landing them um, or anything like with when they're jumping? How do, do you keep a rod bend or how do you kind yeah. of? You definitely want to keep that rod bent and you want to get tension. You want to continue to have tension at all times on that line. Um, the one thing that I say, a lot of people get really excited when there's a big, big fish. Cause these are like, you know, 10 to 20, 25 pound fish. So they get super excited and want to just reel, 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 stay calm. Remember it's going to be a long fight and have patience and, you know, tire the fish out 
eventually you can reel that thing into the net and um it's just amazing. So yeah, I would say, you know, just stay calm and don't yard it. Cause if you, once you yard it, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna lose it and break. Some, it's gonna, your line's gonna break somewhere, whether that's at the knot on the um, fly or at your leader or whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think that that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards as well. Thank you so much. And we'll do again a live queue or we'll hop off. I'll unshare the screen and then we'll all ask questions. So far, so good. I think later. Questions. So, um, all right, we're going to move on. Katie, you are up next. Hi, everyone. So, as I said before, I'm Katie. Um, I'm from British Columbia. I live on Vancouver Island and we definitely get a lot of salmon here. Um, we get pinks, chinook, or kings. Um, we get coho, chum, sockeye. Yeah, we get them all. So <laughs> um, like in the picture on my first slide there, that's a pink um, salmon that I caught in a local flow here. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide there, Heather. <laughs> um, okay, correct size of tackle. So it is different um, here on the island. Um, yeah, like in my slide, most salmon you want to use a seven weight rod for. Um, it just helps bring them in so much faster. It helps um, with them reco like recovering. So when you um, do catch and release, they can go back and hopefully continue on their journey. Um, yeah, and that's the one thing, especially fishing in the summer, you don't want to stress them out. So, <laughs> okay, go to the next slide, Heather. <laughs> Um, wet hands are best. Oh my God. Yes. Wet hands are best. So, um, I've, of course, people have seen it on the internet, social media, people wearing tailing gloves to help with grip, but honestly, they're not helpful for salmon. They will rip the scales off. They take the protective slime off of them that protects them from bacteria and viruses in the water. Um, so anytime you are landing a fish and you want to hold it or get that photo for, whatever reason, um, definitely wet your hands before you touch the fish. fish. It'll just, it's just so much nicer for their scales and the protective slime and best way to handle fish in the summer, especially when it's warm. <laughs> All right, so spay leader example. So I always fish uh, salmon with a Skagit head um, in fresh water. If I'm doing ocean, I'm gonna be using a Scandi line, which is a lot longer and lighter. Skagit head's a lot heavier and shorter. So what the Skagit head does, it actually helps project your line out and helps flip over your leader and your fly because you are using usually bigger flies for salmon. Um, I also use a sink tip, like Chris said, just to get down to where they are because in the freshwater, they're rare. Are they gonna come up and hit a dry fly where I am anyways? They wanna be low in the water where it's cool, especially in the summer because we get our salmon from about mid-July all the way until October, November. So summer, they definitely want to be down cooler. Um, I definitely use TAT-11. Um, our rivers aren't huge here, so we don't have a huge, like super, super deep areas that we would need T-14. And especially in the summertime, the flows aren't super strong, so you don't need that much weight. You end up either going to get snagged or you're going to snag a fish. Um, then also when it comes to your tippet, um, depending what you're fishing for, you would have tippet between 10 pound to 30 pound, and that covers you from small salmon to pinks all the way up to kings. And then we also use um, a non-slip knot, and also I will use a Duncan loop knot, and that um, it creates like a little more movement of the fly because it'll sit in a loop and it'll actually like move around a bit. So it looks a little more natural as it's swimming. And then I also recommend 30 pound for your backing and running line because you get a big Chinook on there, you're gonna want something that's gonna be able to handle it so you can bring it in safely. All right, next slide there, Heather. <laughs> oh, large salmon flies, ooh, these are fun. <laughs> okay, so when I'm fishing for chum, Chinook or coho, those what I would classify as my um, larger salmon. Um, I usually fish like an intruder or like a size two to size three hook, like quite, quite big. Um, so 
<clears throat> when fishing for the larger salmon in the river, they're usually not super hungry, like aggressive in that sense. They're more aggressive of territory because they're spawning. They're like, hey, this is my spot. This is where my lady is. This is where my food is. Like I get out of my way. Like you're in my spot. So what I usually do when I'm fishing for larger salmon, I'll cast up from where they are. So my sting tip has time to come down and get right into the zone of where they're going to be biting or where they're going to be the most aggressive. So that's why usually you would use a big fly, an intruder, and usually you use bright colors like um, for Chinook, I would use, yeah, like white and chartreuse or chartreuse and blue. Um, they really like um, white and silver. I find that for most salmon in my area, like white and silver, like sparkly. Um, and they don't like heavily dressed flies. So the less like feather and fluff on it, the better. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so yeah, I think for the biggest thing when it comes to the bigger flies, do not overdress them if you're gonna be if you're gonna be fishing on Vancouver Island because they don't like a bunch of fluff. They just want they just see a little bit and they're like, okay, mine. So <laughs> that's what I would um, recommend for large salmon flies. Okay, we need another one. Pink salmon flies. So pinks are a lot different here on the island. Um, I have fished for pinks in other parts of BC and they like big flies. Here they want like tiny. We're talking like size eight, size 10 hooks. Um, we usually um, use a pattern, as you can see in the photos there, there's um, pink, uh, pink for pink, which is quite what a lot of people do as a trick. Um, a lot of areas where I fish for pinks, they like this blue color with um, a tungsten bead that's a chartreuse color. And the nice thing about the tungsten bead, it helps get it down even further to where they are and it'll help like, you kind of call it like bottom bouncing because you're hitting the rock, like the flies hitting the rocks as it's going along. And so it catches their eye. And, um, but in other places in BC, I've seen people use like, um, rabbit the rabbit tails like leeches and with trailer hooks and everything and they've had to like strip for them all the salmon that i've mainly caught here is on the swing um the only time i strip is if <laughs> um is in the ocean um when they're coming in they seem to be want to that because at that point in the ocean they're still feeding so they want to see movement they want to see jerks but in the river here you just want to make sure you're right up in the right area so you can swing it right into them. And yeah, that's how I catch most of my salmon is on the swing here on the island in fresh water. Okay, we can go to the next one. Oh, eat local. So we're going to show you how, I'm going to give you some tips on how to harvest your salmon as well, because I've learned some tips and tricks over the years from people, because I've had a lot of struggle doing it myself. So when you catch your salmon, bring it onto the beach or, or um, riverbank, wherever you are that you're allowed to retain fish, depending on your regulations. Um, you wanna make sure you bonk the fish hard and firm, like right between the eyes. I know it sounds a little uh, morbid, but um, it's the best way to kill them. It's the quickest way, least painful way. It's just easier that way. And the, another big thing is make sure you bleed out your fish. You leave any blood in there the meat's going to be horrible <laughs> it's not going to taste good so what i recommend for bleeding out your fish is you just if you carry a knife with you when you go fishing highly recommend it um you're just going to cut the gill plate and then pull the gills out and then you literally just hang it upside down and out it comes <laughs> um um so with a how you want to start it is with a very sharp knife if you have a fillet knife that you bring with you because you're going to be harvesting that's perfect i I'm usually not filleting fish when I'm on the river. I'm just gutting them and bringing them home and then doing the rest of that. So um, with a sharp knife, you wanna start sort of like at the fish's anus bum area and you wanna cut a straight line right up until the gill plate because there'll be a hard part, like the gills are here. There's gonna be a hard cartilage part here by their throat. So you wanna cut all the way up until that hard part. And then you just, but you don't want to go too deep because there is vital organs in there. If you nick like the stomach or anything like that, you could spoil your meat as well. So um, then you're going to go in, go up to where that hard part is on their neck. And you're going to grab right up in there and pull down and everything should come out fairly easily. Um, depending how big the fish is, obviously smaller the fish, the easier it is going to less to pull out than a large fish. 
Um, a spoon is going to be your best tool when harvesting a fish. Um, it just helps scrape out all any of the gunky stuff. And then there's also um, along the fish's back when you cut them open along their spine, there's a thing called a bloodline. And this is a main bloodline that goes across the whole fish. So you want to make sure you re remove that as well because there is blood in it. And you, like I said, you don't want any of the blood um, getting on any of the flesh because it will ruin the taste of it. Um, oh yes, rinse your fish out in the river. Do not leave gunk piles beside you on the riverbank or the beach or whatever. Rinse it out there. Rinse it out in the river. Because um, where I live, we have um, we get a lot of bears, um, mainly black bears. We have the few grizzlies up at the northern part of the island, but I usually don't fish up in that area. Um, so yeah, bears can smell blood from kilometers away. And so they can smell if you have a fresh kill because there's going to be blood obviously and guts. So best rinse them out in the river, throw your gut pile into the river. It's going to help with other um, fish in the river. So I've seen many times when I've thrown, excuse me, eggs or guts into the river. Um, I've had steelhead come up and take the eggs. And I've seen other little trout come up and eat the eggs and um, and the gut pile as well to, for nutrients. So it helps it helps every fishery if you just throw it in there, unless in your area you're allowed to keep the roe and cure it for fishing. Here, unfortunately, we have a ban on roe. Um, also be mindful if a bear walks up on you while you are um, harvesting, um, I highly recommend to give the bear space and if they take your catch, they take your catch like they win. It's their home. You got to respect that this is what they this is what nature does for them. This is their the fish are here for them. Um, so I, I always be respectful. Luckily, I've never had it happen to me. Um, but I have had friends fishing and they've hooked into a fish and a bear comes coming through the river and takes it off of their line. So best thing is just play it safe especially when you are harvesting keep your gut pile away from you keep it down river um and i think that's about it when it comes to harvesting and then okay here's one of my uh, pink salmon from last year that was definitely a bigger one but like i said those little those pink salmon they just want itty bitty bitty here um so you can go to the next one there oh oh we're done <laughs> Well, I hope that gave you guys some helpful tips. And also, if you have any questions afterwards, we will go over those and I can answer them for you. Thank you. All right, Rachel, you're up. All right, those are some tough ones to follow. Um, again, my name is Rachel. I'm from Ontario. Um, and I'll be talking about King and Chinook salmon. Um, this is the same we get the most of here. I mean, we always have runs of like coho and steelhead, but those are lake runs. So we get a lot of Chinook here. Um, so how I do it or how a lot of people I know do it is on the swing. So like any other salmon, you know, you stand on one side of the river, you throw it ac across, you let it run down. Um, and the Chinook here are very aggressive again with their beds or just anywhere. So you want to, you know, let it go down and then kind of strip it forward. Um, and they'll kind of just take those big teeth and just eat whatever's in front of them. Um, yeah, so anything that imitates a bait fish and swinging it um, will get you on a fish, definitely. They're pretty aggressive here. So, so for our setup, um, I do a floating fly line because we don't have a lot of like deep holes. It's more of like shallow, so we don't need a uh, sink line. Um, and then a loop to loop knot and then a 15 pound monoliter. Um, usually just one about four feet, don't need too much. Um, and then you could do a non-slip knot or um, a different knot that has that little loop in it and that allows it to flow more naturally, um, look even more like a bait fish. But so I usually recommend using eight weight rod and eight weight floating line. Um, I have caught Chinook on a three weight nymph rod. Um, that was a lot of fun. It took a really long time to get them in and I was running up and down, but yeah, like an eight weight rod, it's not going to give you as much as a fight as a three weight rod. Um, so yeah, then I just attach the leader and then I attach the 15 pound mono. So, so double deceiver, uh, these actually are a double deceiver. These are flies that I tied that I found worked on Chinook. Um, 
like this is a double deceiver here. It's like an articulated, so it has the two hooks. Um, I find this fly works really, really well. The green, the chartreuse and the white. Um, but Chinook usually like any color. I mean, I've tried this one last year for the first time and it worked really well. It's just fly fur and like a 5D brush in like a brown and black. Um, rainbow patterns work really well. Uh, and again, like in British Columbia, anything with chartreuse or white work really well. I've been successful here, so. <clears throat> Uh, next slide. So, uh, like I said, Chinook are going to give you a little bit of work if you don't have an eight weight rod. Um, even if you do, sometimes the bigger ones just want to run up and down. Um, so you want to make sure to, to buckle up and hold on to that rod as close as you can to your stomach to not allow your rod to come back too much or bend too much. You want to keep it at like a good bend so it doesn't your rod doesn't snap or anything like that. Um, yeah, make sure you stretch before you hook into a 30 pound monster because after about three or four, my arms are usually pretty sore. So, um, yeah, you gotta go to the gym during the winter so that you're ready for fall so you can hold on to them. Um, and lastly, I always try and go with someone. I mean, they are really big fish. Um, I have tried to bring one in myself and it jumped and the hook went through my finger. Um, yeah, so I always recommend having somebody else there. You know, if you bring the fish in close enough, they can kind of help you bring it in. It's a little easier with somebody, so. And just a huge thanks to all of you all. So Chris and Katie and to Rachel, um, thank you so much. We're so blessed to have um, you three amazing co-hosts and just, I think United Will Apply is just this amazing community of such rad individuals and you all are a part of that. So just your time, your energy, your knowledge, like, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and truly just enjoy the journey. This is a journey. This is everybody's journey. We're all on a different journey, different part of the journey. Um, and hopefully maybe your journey is gonna go to Ontario or go to British you know, Columbia or go to Haines, Alaska. So hopefully that's maybe a part of your journey. Um, so just enjoy every part of it. And again, next month uh, is the warm water fishing tips. Um, it's on August 2nd and um, we'll have three, another three incredible co-hosts as well. And I'm gonna stop. Um, and one thing I wanted to say too is, um, uh, I think it was Kate who was asking about the uh, size rods. You know, there's different size rods for different size fish. And actually, um, I mean, we could get into an entire like hour long presentation as far as rods go, action goes, weight goes and everything. But, but truly it's based on um, what size fish you're gonna be fishing and also what size fly you're gonna be fishing. Because especially a lot of times with spay fishing, um, it, if you're gonna be fishing a, a rather large articulated um, fly with a Skagit head and a sink tip, you're gonna be better off to cast a rod such as a seven, an eight weight, a nine weight or a 10 weight. I was just Chinook fishing and I was casting a 10 weight spay rod. So it's, um, it's all based on that, but it's also based on the size fish that you're gonna catch. So, you know, as far as, especially with uh, you know, as we're keep fish wet ambassadors and, and, and a big part of that is using the right size tackle for the right size fish. So, you know, for steelhead, for salmon, especially for salmon, you don't want to use anything less than a seven weight. Um, part of that is just because you're not going to be able to bring that fish in in an adequate amount of time. And if you do release that fish, then releasing that fish, um, if you don't, you know, if you basically fight it too much, a lot of lactic acid buildup, it's like us running a marathon or exercising for too long, it can be harmful to us. So the same thing goes for fish. So it's all about, you know, using the right size tackle. And as far as salmon goes, seven weights, the, the smallest weight rod you should use, on average, probably eight weights, and maybe a nine weight is going to be more, more common, more normal. I have a tip for the whole system you were just talking about. Um, the best part that I found is the drag system on the reel too. So the whole combination between the type of line, the fly weight, obviously the rod weight, and then the drag. If you don't have good drag, especially for bigger fish, don't even bother <laughs> trying to bring it in yourself, right? But anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I'm super stoked about actually that pink salmon popper that you're talking about. I don't know if Katie's tried any surface flies or anyone else in BC, but I am stoked to try that this year. 
Um, I've actually haven't tried any popper flies because they would only be used in the ocean. But one of my buddies I fish with, he uses poppers all the time. So maybe this year I'll. Ah, I might see on the river again. And <laughs> I'm going to head your way more this year. Yay. <laughs> and I would say, so when I, I went to Yakutat, which I think is kind of close to Chris-ish. Um, and when we went to Yakutat to Icy Bay, um, they all the guy everybody nobody had fished a popper or a wog and I'm like you know what I'm gonna fish this wog and so I ended up my dad and I ended up wogging and then everybody that was there wanted to wog because we were laughing and screaming and you're definitely not going to be catching at the most fish right like but to catch one on a wog oh man that to me is like everything um yeah. and, and just like chris said as far as the incoming tide that was one thing that we found too is i tried wogging and like the water as soon as it was fresh and then once they kind of figured out we were there they wanted to take a deeper kind of stripped fly but once that incoming tide came in then you start having fresh fish come in that are uneducated and then you <laughs> to walk again so i i challenge all of y'all to try yeah. walking and then let us let's we should do like a whole 12 days of wogmas again yeah. this oh, sure. <laughs> that would be awesome yeah. so, that's cool thank you yeah absolutely um what other questions let me just look um there's a question from cynthia chris do you have any tips on fishing for staging coho and estuaries thank you so much for your presentation Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't actually. Um, I think that it, it, I would probably use the same techniques that I use um, if it's a deep sort of staging area that they're in, a deep hole. I would kind of fish it the same as I would um, anywhere else in the river. The one thing I didn't mention um, in my presentation is uh, just to make sure, like if you were, far up in the river and you know there's probably reds happening I don't fish those at all like I try to stay away from them at all times so just making sure like if you see fish just kind of milling around that they're not actually on the reds um but so I try to stay you know always in sort of the the heart of the rivers in the current but yeah maybe yeah sorry I don't really have a good answer for that Mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, can you explain what a red is? Because there might be some, some individuals here that may not know what a red is. Sure. So a red is basically where um, they are spawning together. And um, you can typically see, it. so, and I've seen this in other, other rivers too, but typically you can see, like, if you look at the bottom of the river where it's shallow and, you know, you'll see a fish do like this on their tail. That means they're like getting ready to move sort of all that like debris and dirt on the rocks and getting ready to drop the eggs for um, a male to come in. And so when you look at the river, you can see kind of these circles everywhere on the bottom and those are typically reds. And you obviously really want to avoid walking, wading in the reds, but personally I avoid targeting those fish as well. Awesome, thank you. And Cynthia, you have your hand raised. It was just because I wasn't sure whether or not you'd see yeah. the chat box, but I'll, I'll chime in on the wog idea. Yeah. I, when I'm fishing at home, I mostly fish at estuaries for the coho, and I use a pink gurgler or an orange gurgler or a MyWiki popper just to see if they're there because they might not take the fly, but then, you know, then I'll switch out to an intermediate line and use a sinking fly, but it's just a fun way to just really see if you're, if you're fishing over a school of fish. Well, you're going to have to be a part of the wogging uh, 12 days of wogamus then too. <laughs> I would love to go wogging. I love top water fishing. Thank you. Where, Cynthia, where's home for you? I'm on Vashon Island in Washington. Okay, cool. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and I just saw Kathy, you have your uh, hand raised. Okay. Yeah. I'm a little confused. First, I have to say hi, Chris. <laughs> we miss you. Uh, but my question is, I miss is, you too. is the wogging referring to the fly or, okay, it's the, the floating like huge thing, that pink thing, or is it all colors? It can be all colors, but you know, like a polywog, like a pro. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. it's just a, it's a reference to wogging, just like a certain tech fishing technique that's more specific to 
silver salmon. Um, but yeah, it can be a pink mouse. It can be like your typical like uh, bass poppers. It could be all kinds of things. Base a gurgler, like anything that's top water and you're kind of popping and pausing or stripping or creating a V to bring it in. So. Okay. All right. I want to make sure we're doing it the right way down this way. <laughs> and whatever, pink, I mean, salmon love pink, but try other colors. Like I've caught, if you look at my 12, like if you look at the hashtag 12 days of Wogmas, like you'll see, I used a purple and white mouse. I used a green popper. Like I was trying to find what the fish wouldn't eat. Like it was, not, you know, so it's when it's good, it's good. Um, especially on an incoming tide. And that's kind of, really for all salmon, truly. I mean, Rachel, how far from uh, how from, from salt are you? Are you a ways or does the tide reflect or does it, um, do you look at the tides based on your fishing? Uh, like, do you mean like Sault Ste. Marie or like salt? Just salt, like do, are the tides oh, reflect your river? I believe we're pretty far. I wouldn't say there's a lot here. Um, so not really the tides we look at, no. Right. But, yeah. And Katie, do you as do you look at tides? Yeah, because we're well. I'm on an island, so I'm surrounded by the ocean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, um, tides are um, especially when fishing for salmon. Tides are very crucial. But if you're fishing um, off the beach, and is there any specific tide like apps that you both use, or is there, or do you just Google tides? I mean, what is there anything that you use specifically for tides? I honestly just go to um, the government website for British Columbia and they give you the tides for like the next month. Cool. So you can see like where it's gonna be optimal in what areas. And then I use this app called Tides and it's great. Um, you can see the high tide, low tide, you can see tomorrow's high tide, low tide, and then also the variation in the tide, like how high the tide is versus how low it is, which is really helpful. Cool. Uh, Jessica. Hi. Hi. Um, I know nothing about salmon fishing, mm -hmm. but I was up in Alaska two years ago at the end of July. And being a fly fisherman in the east, you know, I was interested to learn and see the salmon. I'd never seen wild salmon before. So I was in the Palmer area and also um, near Seward. Mm -hmm. And I was in two different water courses, one where there were young salmon, it appeared, that were trying to get up uh, a mountain stream and were just sort of hanging. And then down by Seward, I was in a much bigger body of water sort of watching. And particularly <laughs> there, in that, in that area near Seward, at the end of July and into August, when I was there, a lot of the salmon were dying. You know, they'd, they'd done their thing. I guess they'd spawned or whatever, and they were dying. So since I know nothing about salmon, the, the dying ones, obviously, you don't want to mess with those. And you have to fish when they're just coming up the river, correct? Before they begin to die, correct? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay. Yeah. So I, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, um, usually if you start to see them like essentially like falling apart, we call them zombies. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I saw. Yeah. <laughs> um, I usually just don't even fish because like right, right. they've already done their thing. Yeah. Um, and they're just there to finish out their course. So I. If, if I see a bunch of zombies and there's no fresh fish, I ain't fishing. Right. Yeah. yeah, and they're just, I don't even want to touch them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I <laughs> saw a lot of dying fish near Seward. So it must have been later in the, the season. Well, um, it, it can also depend. Um, every area will have a different run. So yeah. um, like here on the island, like there's rivers that will get certain salmon before, you know, up the island or south of the island. So it's just knowing your river flows and knowing what timings that they'll sort of come in um, when you know that they're gonna be the freshest. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And One key part was not mentioned was be, trying to read a different system does have to do with the amount of water that's in that system. So if you look to make sure it's glacier fed, 
it will probably have a lot of water in it and cold water, which means you'll have a longer, fresher run. Yes. And if you're not, you know, if you got a couple spring fed areas or lake fed, depends how big that lake is, you know, how much water it's going to get, if it has a wear on it, a dam on it. And then you can kind of read where they're going to stage along the way. But a lot of rivers, especially for the island, as Katie probably knows, <laughs> um, we have smaller rivers here. And so we really have to watch the level of the water. So before I go out, I'll look at the water levels that the government has set up. Sorry. Um, and then I'll make sure that, you know, there's enough water in there to actually even go when the tide is high. And I know that they're running if there's even going to be fresh fish. True. So it usually for salmon, for me personally, I'll go to the lower couple kilometers of a system just to get the fresher, more aggressive fish and just work with the tides. That's, that's my experience. And <laughs> one thing too, Jessica, is that, and for those that don't know, so salmon, once they come into fresh water, they die. So you'll hear a lot of, you know, things that salmon is life. I mean, especially up in just anywhere. I mean, as far as once they do decay, all of all of their bodies, they, they go into the dirt, they, they feed the birds, they feed the bears, they feed us, they feed the trout. So, I mean, it's like salmon truly are the most amazing creatures. And um, I actually play the cranberry zombie song when I'm swinging for fish sometimes when I have zombies like the, like, cause they'll scare you. They'll come and smack you on the legs and, you know, um, especially if you're trout fishing because trout, or all fish, grayling trout, dollies, char, they all come in, um, in behind the salmon because the salmon are dropping eggs, the salmon are decaying. So you can fish different techniques in order to catch larger fish because of the salmon. And so when you're doing those techniques, there are zombies sometimes that do kind of scare you because they run into your legs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, just how it's, it's just a part of life. And it's so cool to think that these salmon are what they're creating, like where we're at in our life and our world is be, has to do so much because of salmon. I mean, it's so awesome. It's, they're just a fish that we want to fight for, you know? So, um, yeah. And like Chris said, you know, her coho, uh, run is later in September, whereas in some areas like Southwestern Alaska, some of it's earlier, such as in July or even on the Kenai kind of Seward area, it's a little bit earlier than it would be in Haines. So there's different times a year for different runs and different water and all that. Like salmon, just learning about the salmon is just awesome. They're awesome, they're awesome fish. So anyways, um, one question uh, from Georgiana. She asks to all the presenters, do you ever use a shooting head system to fish for salmon? So I would assume this is probably like a single hand, yeah? Yeah, because I would I would label a skagit head sort of like a shooting head because it is weighted, so it's going to shoot out your line. So I, I would consider a skagit head a shooting head. Awesome. Anybody else do any do either of you use a shooting head or is it all just like sink tip or full sink or floating? Yeah, I'll go for a massive shooting head for Chinook and with a sink tip in some bigger waters for sure. Yeah, yeah. bigger flies, bigger hook. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what other questions do y'all have? I'm just looking. I don't see anything else in the chat, but feel free to raise your hands. Or Debbie, did you have a question? Yeah, I was uh, curious, Katie, are you fishing the Georgia Strait side or the ocean side? Um, I actually will fish both sides. Um, so it really does, like I said, it does depend on what I'm fishing for. So usually pinks, um, we're lucky here on the island, we get pinks every year. We don't have an alternate uh, year. We get them every year. And when I fish for them, they're through the Georgia Strait. They come up that way. There is some, I think, that come around on the West Coast side, but I've never really fished for them on the West Coast side. I've only ever fished for them on sort of more of the Georgia Strait. But when it comes to Chinook, um, I will fish more on the West Coast side because they get a bigger, better run of them. Thank you. Awesome. Any Are other there, questions? Do you mind explaining kokanee? Oh, kokanee salmon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like kokanee is trout. Yeah. So it's a landlocked sockeye. Yeah. So 
so the, yeah, there's landlocked, so meaning that they can't go to the ocean and back. And then there are most of the other salmon then will go to the ocean and go back. And one thing too, um, <laughs> when I was fishing a couple weeks ago, the adults weren't in yet. And just like what uh, Melanie had talked about, how colder water, you know, based on the water levels, Alaska in, for instance, had a really good winter. If I only wish that we had, where I live, had a good winter. But so the waters are, the water levels are really high and the waters are very cold. So those Chinook have not, well, they showed up the week I left, of course, but they um, were not in yet just because high water and also because the water level or the water temps were too cold. So we caught a lot of jacks. So you might hear the term jack. Um, they sure fight. They're awesome. You know, I loved every jack for sure, but they're just a, you know, certain salmon will be in the water or in the ocean systems for longer and jacks tend to be like a one year salt fish and then they come back and they're just a smaller Chinook or a smaller King salmon. They still fight, they're still awesome. And I still give love to every single one of them, but there's some anglers that are like, oh, you just caught a jack. And I'm like, hey, this is beautiful. Like we should be embracing this. Um, but I think maybe that's the difference between some women versus men. Uh, anglers because we do appreciate and value all of our fish um, but yeah so knowing that the jack is just going to be a lesser uh, amount of time in the ocean so that's just another term that you might hear awesome um, what other questions uh, Simone asked do you fish for salmon after they have spawned and um, Simone uh, Chris definitely answered this question just saying and everyone just you know, as far as just ethically, um, you know, not fishing on reds or salmon spawning beds um, and just not targeting any, any spawning fish. It's just, you know, when you are closer to the ocean and or, you know, some of the different fisheries, it's just, um, as far as ethically, you can fish for those, but try to just stray away from any of the spawning fish. So, um, yeah, anybody else? Melanie. <laughs> had a question for Rachel. <laughs> I missed a little bit about your Chinook. So you said something about some of them coming through lakes and then I missed where you're from. So I apologize. Yeah, so we actually run um, like freshwater salmon. I know you guys do saltwater. Um, so ours are oh. coming from like Lake Ontario and other lakes. Um, oh, okay. So they're freshwater over saltwater. Yeah. And so. that's why they're mostly colored up, eh? Yes. Yeah, and usually yeah. like when they, like when they're right, if they're caught in the lake, like I know people, like they're silvery greeny, but by the time they get up into the rivers, they're like that green, like a very light green. And then by the time they spawn, they've done their thing, they get dark and then they get that zombie decaying. And then, so. Do you ever, is there a tension around that like area? Cause I mean, obviously salmon don't usually taste good once they start getting colored up, but. Do you ever retain out there? Um, honestly, no. Um, I, I, yeah, no. Usually by the time they get up to where I am, they're kind of like not fresh, fresh. They're still fresh, but yeah. I mean, you could take, like you could, they're at that point, but it's still, yeah. if I were to go closer to the lakes, like right at the mouth of where the river starts, I'm sure like those are pretty fresh. You could take those, but um, I just kind of let them go and let them live out their, the rest of their journey and yeah really curious because you mentioned like a really big like bait fish fly for the Chinook there and here as Katie mentioned like our salmon really like sparse 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 flies like when you've yeah. got the marabou I've put like maybe eight little fibrils of feather on there yeah <laughs> I know, know like some thinking. people still, yeah some people still fish like it like an egg pattern or something smaller mm -hmm. um but I find the the rivers that I fish they like the the swing and the in the bait fish so um Neat. i probably fish it differently than some people i know some people might like smaller flies but i've learned and i found that they like the swing and they like the the chase of the of the fly so i find that so fascinating because i mean I, katie i don't know if you've experimented probably i've tried <laughs> using flies and it just does not work it does not work i've tried it i don't with know maybe it's because like you like ours are fresh and like so i don't know if that makes a difference but no we're talking about tidal chrome chinook or coho oh or okay yeah. all of them they don't like it <laughs> like it's <laughs> weird we're yeah, i know like steelhead like little tiny flies but the schnook i maybe huh. just because they're ontario fish they're weird i don't know <laughs> 
Well, and how awesome is it that you can, you have the opportunities to catch um, salmon from, I mean, it's, it's an awesome, it's so cool that you have that opportunity, right? Yeah. Like so many fishing opportunities all over the world and it's awesome. So yeah, lucky for you. I wish I was like Chris where the river was in my backyard, but <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty close. I'm not going to complain. So we all need to do a United on the fly trip up to go see Chris and a British yes. Columbia and Ontario. <laughs> Wouldn't be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> what There's is love camping on Vancouver Island. <laughs> yes, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, okay, so last question here since it's 6.15 and I want to respect all of your um, time. Um, and this is a great question and this doesn't just have to do with salmon either, but any tips on how to practice, how to practice throwing big heavy flies? Do y'all have any tips on that? Jeez. Duck and duck. <laughs> yeah. Duck. yeah. <laughs> prepare prepare to get hit yeah. yeah i've nicked myself in the back of the head a couple prepare times to hold my hood up. Point. oh hood's a good idea hat yeah, backwards, hood like... also i have seen friends hook beanies and throw them into the river <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that i did when i first started out was i wore a buff over my hat as like some sort of coverage. And actually my partner does this all the time when he guides, cause he's afraid that clients are gonna hook them. And so I used to, you know, and I still do that when I'm doing really heavy flies. And then I, I do a little duck too. Like <laughs> right when I'm ready to go, it's, there's a little duck and I try not to false cast, false cast a lot. Yeah. I think the main part too is making sure like with spay casting, you're like, you're having your elbow tucked in and you're really like shooting it off and like giving it lots of power with that the butt handle of the rod, I should say. And that'll help turn it over. And also shooting heads and having that weight will help the fly flip over a lot easier. And I'm watching your where the wind is coming from because I've hooked yeah. my my butt way too many times. Luckily, I use and one thing too, barbless hooks, right? So it's your it's way easier to take a fly out of a body part if they're uh, barbless, just okay. FYI. But look at the the direction of the wind. So knowing that, and one thing too is not changing directions too easy. Or whoa, it's so sunny out. Um, but if you're going like this, and then don't just all of a sudden change directions without doing a couple of false casts to, to go to a different direction. The other thing too is um, a wider loop sometimes helps with a bigger fly. Uh, and you can, and you don't have to false cast a lot, just as everyone had said, but if you know the YMCA, right? Everybody says cast at 10 and two, and that's perfect for 35 feet of fly line at a certain arc, blah, blah, blah. But if you open that up, so rather than 10 and two, you open it up to about like, uh, like nine and two thirty or something. So you're just opening up your cast. It'll open up your loop. Therefore, and you can just do like one pick up, lay down, and that sh that'll be easier as well. So, but it's practice. Um, yeah. A lot of catch and go, but it's definitely practice. Um, and knowing the wind direction, I think for me personally, because I've cried because I have had hooks in my butt. So <laughs> I <can> relate. <laughs> Hopefully that helped. Um, yeah, if, um, I, again, thank you all to the three of you and to uh, Melanie too for helping and jumping in. Um, thank you all for just your awesome questions and just for just being a part of this pretty rad community. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you on the next one. And if you have any other questions, um, we're gonna record this or it's recorded, we'll upload it to YouTube and then each week, We'll have a Tuesday tip will be from each co-host. So you'll, there'll be a blog written. You'll have like the actual video of their specific presentation and there'll be a link for the entire presentation. Um, so yeah, please feel free to share it and learn and connect with each woman and um, ask questions because we all are here to help mentor and, and share the love. So thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Katie, Rachel, and Chris. You all are, I, I can't say thank you enough. I really appreciate it. So awesome. Thanks All right, y'all. So. Have a fantastic evening and happy fishing. Bye, guys. Thank you guys for okay. having me. Yes. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.